Yeah. All right, why don't we um, reconvene as one? So, uh, yeah, go ahead. What are some thoughts and maybe there's a few things real quick? There are two trees on our house, and um, the guy that they crane off the dogs and the rifle is a pocket, which may not be on the train. Um, you like that song? It's just catchy. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this a Malvern that's talking? Lee Thompson, right? I don't know why I think it's a Malvern. Oh, you did? Okay, I don't know if Malvern is talking. I used to live in Malvern. Well, Malvern. Yeah, closer. I live in St. Paul. I'm here in St. Paul. So Malvern, I think, is probably just there. Yeah, yeah, Malvern is closer. Have you been to the Greyhound Kit? I can answer so many questions about where you <laughs> I generally got, yeah, I remember. The Greyhound Cafe, which is in um in the, in the shopping center there where Sutel's, have you been to Um It's a fabulous vegan place. A guy, a guy, a Hispanic guy named Joseph Solaro. He's fabulous. Where is it in Malvern? Yeah, it's right, it's right in that shopping center where Sutel Cafe is, which is. Use an Indian grocery, there's a little Indian grocery in there. Yeah. I'm not sure, I'm going to ask you if you've been to, there's a lot of food places. Um, there's one thing that's called, there's one in Christmas town called, they call it Amsterdam, but it's all raw. Oh, really? Because so, I'm, I'm, I'm about 80%. I mean, last night, this house was a person who cooked food I eat. Yeah, I'm not sure raw as well. And if you want, like, really good raw food, you, you got to try that. I'm just going to see if I can get the other food. Okay, that sounds good. So, so I wanted to start by asking Levi. You, you had a question all ready to go with oh, this morning. Whatever happened to that guy? Uh, that's the word. Well, this is the, the good thing and the bad thing. I actually told Professor Bergens about it. Is that um, you know, everyone here is so thorough that it was answered like you know halfway through your speech. You know, which was kind of the idea of like where did where did what are the origins of where it came from and could the answer to the problem be in the origins, kind of, you know, like a how every vaccine, you know, has a, a virus inside of it? Well, you know, I can I can say this that my own. I was talking to Bianca about this earlier. That I didn't start out working on animal working philosophy. Um, I started working on other things, and I came in through German philosophy and Martin Heidegger teaching a course on this term that Kyle was in. Um, and after I finished my graduate work and I wrote my first book on Descartes, I decided I had earned the right to just work on something in philosophy that addressed the passion of mine, which was my love for animals. And by that time, I'd been a vegetarian for many years. Um, early in all of that work, I went vegan. Um, and the first of the several books I've written about animals and animal ethics is a historical book. And I was basically teaching myself in writing that book the whole history of Western thinking about the moral status, the cognitive abilities and moral status of non human animals. And just like my work in all areas of philosophy, I find historical evolution of thought really illuminating. And so I keep coming back. I use that book myself as a reference source, almost as if somebody else wrote it. Because I don't have as good a memory as, you know, and it's not photographic, it's like some of these details I have to go back and I, God, I totally forgot about that. But the, the idea of logos that you find in Aristotle, I think, is, is a real defining moment. And also that change in Genesis, I think, is also a kind of defining moment. So I do think going back to origins is really powerful in this close thing. So I need to disconnect and try it again. Sure. Thanks. Did you call it? I did. Do you think there's anything in those those origins of, of Genesis that um, there could be a seed of fixing? Well, you know, so the the, the title of the first animals book there um, was it's animals and uh, anthropocentrism and its discontents. The very all of them. Who writes a book and calls it anthropocentrism and its discontents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, where'd you get your book? Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's like my hometown of Los Angeles. You either love it or hate it. And it's true of that book title as well. And it's a rip on the title of the book by a Sigmund Freud called Civilization and its Discontents. And what I explained in the introduction is the idea of the book is that 
you have this dominant discourse in the anthropocentric mm -hmm. human uh, exclusivity and superiority throughout history of Western thought. But then at the same time, there is a kind of dimension of discontent, a dissatisfaction with that dominant discourse. So, it's so all of these way back to the early beginning. So, it was working. And oh, like you see some of the and it just seems like Aristotle's doing a long time process. I so could cancel and then try to get try to get uh, behavior. And he shows a tremendous awareness of all kinds of ingenuity and adaptability. Adaptability. So we don't have video at all because unfortunately that camera was a video. Uh, it's um, the LCD screen died on it. Uh, so this is what's live streaming. So we wouldn't be able to hear her. Um, and she would be able to hear us, but I don't think she would be able to fire this thing and do it. Yes. But so it says why you pick me up. That are very positive on animals, but they kind of get swept under the tide into the undertow of this dominant discourse. So, so they try to pepper throughout uh, the history of Western philosophy of thinkers who proclaim human superiority. So in many cases, there are sort of passing indications of an awareness that that dominant discourse is deficient. Yeah. And that's what's interesting about studying the history. It's not just the history of a bunch of mistakes. There's actually a little trail of breadcrumbs in there if you really pay close attention to it. So can I bring it back to Kilika? Okay, so um, so yeah. we'll so uh, Gary refers to this book by Kimika and Donaldson. Uh Kimika is best known actually for his work in political philosophy mm -hmm. on multiculturalism, which is um, an attempt to argue for full citizenship for people with from different cultures, but in addition, certain special consideration. And uh, I think of uh, Zoopolis as modeled on Kimlicka's multicultural work, right? That is, uh, and so, so very self conscious that there's that what is the place of non human animals in our society? What sort of, you know, and, and uh, but unlike in the multiculturalist work where as individuals, um, if you are from some minority culture, you have all the regular rights of citizenship plus some other things. For the, the non-human animals, the idea is that there might be some things you have in addition, but some things that you lack that other, others do. So their, uh, their solution in Zoopolis is to distinguish among three kinds of animals, uh, what we sometimes call wild animals, who are not citizens, but what might <coughs> The human obligation with respect to them is to just leave them alone. They're sovereign. Right, they're sovereign. Then there are um, yeah, what they call denizens, right, which are like so in, in contemporary uh, human societies, we would think of pigeons, rats, squirrels, right? Well, no, 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 no. Right, animals that live sort of among us but not with us. Um, and we, have, we would have certain obligations to them. And then what they call citizens. And, and I think that I agree with you, Gary, that. That their solution with respect to the, the so called citizens is highly problematic. So, for example, they think that um, we would allow such animals which were originally purpose bred, we wouldn't, we wouldn't breed them anymore, but we would allow them to reproduce naturally. And, and then, but because they're citizens, they'll have obligations of citizenship, which would mean that you could milk the cows, you could uh, shear the sheep. And that, I think, is highly problematic. Yeah. That said, I, I do think it's worth thinking about what our relationship to the various animals who will exist in the world in, in the speaking future is, um, not just because it's a problem we want to have, but because also I think it helps us think about these other questions. And, you know, the, the because there will be, I think an example of sort of problem. Right. So there will be at the very least liminal species. And I don't think it there will be a lot of sovereign species because for better or worse, and I think almost entirely worse, we live in the Anthropocene, right? That is this we, there is not we're just the Yeah, that's right. There is not like some wild space where okay, that's where all the non human animals will live and all the humans will live in this sort of, you know, urban area. Right, so there are going to be animals with whom we interact, and we're going to have some sort of relationship with them. Um, and I think it's useful to think about what 
that might be. So we're not going. So even so, so they say we, should, we wouldn't be breeding dogs, but we would allow them to, to mate. Um, even if, so, so do we stop them from mating? What if, what if you know wolves start to re-domesticate themselves, right? Which is sort of an account of how we sort of hold them off, right? And right, oh, yeah. right. But um, so, so the so, so I actually think it's a really interesting book, uh, not because I like their solutions, but because I think they've raised real problems, and I wonder whether those are worth talking about. Sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't have a lot to say about them, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I find the book an interesting publication. I mean, you know, one thing is that there is this tendency to think in lots of types of uh, intellectual discourse that what we should be focusing on is the right answers, but to the extent that there is a kind of paucity of right answers, sometimes thinking about wrong answers is very productive to be more illuminated in thinking about what might be a right one. Um, and so for me, it's been very stimulating to think about the question that they raised at the beginning of the book, which is, look, what, what they say about Gary, Gary Franzione's approach is, it's a very negative view of animal rights. And I get one thing that's in the point of view. I mean, I mean, they say, well, it's good. You're saying this? Well, 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 the problem with contemporary animal rights theory is it's all very negative. It says leave animals alone. There's no, there's no sense of a positive sense of relations between humans and non-human animals. And what we want to do with Swapless is come up with this idea of a positive sense of community with affirmative measures or affirmative uh, provisions or imperatives. And that's what they say people like you and me do. But they, but they also say that um, people will never accept the position that I promote, the abolitionist position, because it's too radical. So I find so what uh, really I don't understand what they're talking about in the book if it is not some sort of benign exploitation. What aspects of it is radical? Is too radical. The idea that people are gonna stop eating them, wearing them, using them they are going to before they became the identity. And I imagine the book would look different now if they wrote it now. Well, so it is it is what it is. It, it, you know, what? But, I, said, that's interesting. I, mean, don't, I, mean, I mean, that was my impression when they were presenting it at the conference that you had that was that, like, now they're vegan, I think they will no longer be on board with the, well, the cow has to provide milk to pay its way or whatever. I don't think that would be part of it anymore. I mean, I mean what, what it, it certainly has been interpreted as a book that argues for the possibility of compassionate exploitation, which I think is nonsense. Um, I think I'll get to the clear when we get into stuff in that day. But, um, but they also, uh, they have an issue with my views about domestication, but they basically say, well, you know, disability rights advocates would disagree with me because dependency is really a good thing. The answer is dependency, when you're talking about disability, things that happen within a very particular context um, in which um, the vulnerable humans are protected in various ways in which things can be done if they're not being protected. So the idea that we think it's okay to bring species, continually bring species into existence who are perpetually dependent on us, um, I, I, I just uh, I don't agree with that. And I don't think it's analogous to, um, you know, when we, when we have somebody, when, when there's a human being who doesn't, you know, who, is, who does not achieve autonomy at some point, Life. We generally think of that as a sad situation, an unfortunate situation. That doesn't mean we don't love those people or take care of those people, but we think that that's unfortunate that they have not achieved. But, but with domestication, the whole idea is to bring beings into existence where we're okay. But they're not, so their answer is they're not going to bring those beings, they're just not going to. So we wouldn't, most of us would think it'd be wrong to sterilize people who have well, certain disabilities. Well, and, that's what there's, and that's what you and I and others are saying we ought to be doing. Right in the sort of so put aside what they say about cows and sheep. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question because this came up when I was in England last week. We were talking about mm -hmm. this this, um, this idea. Um, let's assume that we genetically engineer a group of humans, mm -hmm. and um, they had no families. You know, they had no, nobody to worry about them. They were just created in life They had normal 
they had adult strength, but they had the they had no mental capacity. They might sort of be politicians, in my but <laughs> <laughs> they might be perfect. Um, but they had no mental capacity, no mental capacity. They had the mental ability of a, of, a, of an infant, but they were strong. They could be directed, and they could be done. You, you could have them work at, in essence as slaves, and you could have them, um, you know, you could have them do all sorts of environmental hazards sort of thing. And what, what? If if we figured out that that was a really bad thing to do, would anyone say, well, gee? We did something really bad. We if we created this, you know, we, we engineered this. But now that they're here, we have to allow them to continue to reproduce and stopping them from reproducing would be wrong. So therefore we have to let them because we did something wrong, but we can't stop it. Um, and it would seem to me I, I would have no trouble saying we should stop that. We should not have done it in the first place. We should certainly should perpetuate it. So, so the question is, what, what, how good an analogy is? I think that's a pretty good analogy for most of the animals being exploited for food and fiber. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how good an analogy it is to dogs, but with respect to whom some of the evidence is that we sort of co-evolved and domesticated each other. For my book, we, we, if you buy the story, yeah, okay, let's assume you buy, let's assume the story, though. the story is that they got close to us because they got food and they alerted us to when there were problematic, you know, things that were dangerous for us. And we lost some of our sense of smell. And they right. And and, but, but they certainly sort of didn't buy into sort of being feeding these cruel. I mean, you know, they, they, right. they, you know, they, and, and so this idea, I mean, it was also at a time, Michael, when the relationship was they, they, they chose to be near us because we gave them food. But they they could yeah. go when they wanted, and they could live perfectly fine where they want, you know, when they, without us. What we have now is not anything remotely resembling that. Granted, and I think Kimmel and Donaldson would say, and in the in the future, we wouldn't you wouldn't keep your Pekingese and prevent her from you know only have pure breed Pekingese. You but there would be dog denizen dogs. Some of whom would come into our houses and then go off on their own. And, and uh, to me, that's. No, you know, talked about citizen dogs. No, I understand. I think that's wrong, too. But I think denizen dogs, I could, you know, I could. What you're we describing is. Well, uh, first of all, that, did you see the uh, late mother 2049? Because you just described, uh, described the plot. Did I see what? Late <laughs> mother 2049. No, I thought that was not the plot. <laughs> <laughs> They created these, these uh, people, and they were giving birth. That was the whole business of it. But they had memories. Yes, but it, 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 you made people, and they started giving birth and on themselves. And that's pretty much what you said. Well, no, I'm not trying to sort of distinguish yeah. the yeah. situation from what we're talking about, where where disabled. I mean, there's one thing about talking about disabled people and sort of you know, people who are. Who, who have certain levels of intelligence and whether they should allow be allowed to reproduce, which is different from creating this. I think mean, the analogy is with domestication is we had genetically engineered this group of beings. Would it be wrong to stop? But that in terms of thoughts, like for example, you have co evolution between a clownfish and a seaman, where that happens over a period of time. The same thing with dogs. What you described before was the way dogs behave in a good part of the world. America is unique. We have all these wonderful little breeds. We have bats and everything like that. Most of the world is the dogs are just running around and doing that. Village dogs. I mean, I was in Athens. Uh, and dogs are everywhere, just running around free. So that's most of the world. Well, but also remember when we're having these stories, these domestication stories. This is like in situations that where they're getting hit by cars all the time, and they're getting. I mean, right. I mean the idea that dogs can live. In, in packs in places you know like like India or you know, or New York City or whatever you know is I think it's wrong. I mean they don't do that. They don't. They, right. That's you, 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 um, talking about you know uh, say there's disabled uh, people. I I've, I've been approached especially when I was in Philadelphia um, to do a tubal ligation <coughs> on um, a disadvantaged woman, young. Eight, 17, 18 years old, because 
she wanted to, she was marginally um, <coughs> able to live with other people away from home, but it would be men and women living together, and she was the, well, the caretaker, I should say, right. was in charge. And um, it was always a problem of, is it, who, who makes the decision? Is it, is it the uh, child? Or is it the or is it the caretaker? And it would be problematic because the disabled wouldn't understand completely what was happening, but knew that she could never reproduce. And she knew enough to know that reproduction was everybody else did it. I want to be like everybody else, even though she never would be. It was always a problem. And I was it. Huh? Of course it's a problem. But I mean But I'd have to bring in somebody legal, a lawyer. To represent Do you object to my profession getting <laughs> uh, no, no, I, 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 of course, of course, we would have to, you know, yeah, that that there are problems that we need to yeah. in it, but but to me, um, those problems really don't tell us a whole lot of how we should deal with domesticated animals. Right, I understand, um, but it's, it's, yeah, I understand, I understand that, but. Uh, I'm just bringing this up with, with humans. It, it's a, uh, it can be a. Well, you sort of, any time you have some human beings having to act as represent representatives on behalf of either other humans or non-human animals who can't speak for themselves, there's an inherent yeah. problem with determining what would what they would wish for if they could express their wishes. Right. I mean, even I mean, we've all put uh, most of us have put an animal down for whatever reason. And you know the vet will always say, "Are you sure this is what you want? Please sign and do that stuff." Um, it's very difficult. Yeah, it is. I had it last week, and it's the it's it, difficult. It is, and the only way I, I have been able to deal with it, we have twenty one, I think twenty five, because we we adopt dogs that have been abused that generally people don't want to adopt dogs. We call problems blind dogs, and 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 we had to have a very it was interesting because this was a dog. Who was from a quote responsible breeder? This was not a puppy you know, dog. This was a dog that you know that came from a that was used by a quote responsible breeder to three shelters. He spent the first nine years of his life in the cage. Nobody touched him except taking him out of the, the, the cage to start and then going back. In the cage. He was completely unsocialized when he got. As a matter of fact, he, he, they couldn't find a home for him. We took him um, because in, in the foster home he was in. If anybody got near me, he'd throw himself against the job. He was completely freaked out around me. We had somebody who worked with wolves come and work with us to try to sort of get him to relate to us and to our pack. And um, and he was a very special dog. He loved him very, very much. He had for two, two years and a few months. Um, he was a very difficult dog. Probably the most difficult dog he had when we toured. He got kidney drive last week. That went down. Now, he would say, well, how do you do that? How do you make the decision? The answer is, all I can do is is say, what I want to continue to live right. in, that's, that's the best that's I can do. That's, that's all you need to do. Because what I want to live in is his way. He went and did the kidney failure. He was convulsive. He was having a seizure. Right. And, the, and the, you know, they, they stabilized him once. They thought he had Addison's disease. They gave him whatever they liked him for Addison's disease. And it just, I think he probably had some infiltrator, something in the adrenals, the right. price of tumor. And, but he went into shutdown. It was a horrible decision. I hate it. I had to do it many times in my life. Um, and and you know I I dread it, but um, this is I hate domestication. These are the moral messes that they make, you know. And it's like we can't clean them up. And I really would love, you know, I, I don't think we should live with other species. We should live with ourselves. We should live with other members of the humans. We shouldn't be living with animals. But the problem is, is that there are a lot of zillion of animals, you know, zillion animals that not help and, and care and help. And um, and so you take care of them. But the idea. That you know, I have these desires with animal people all the time. But what's wrong with continuing to breed them? If you love them, look at the way they're great stuff. Yeah, my dogs have a great life, but they're still completely dependent on people when they eat, when they drink, when they go out. Every aspect of their lives is controlled by me. They have a luxury. Yes, they, they, and they live in this another world, this vulnerability. They're not human. They're not, not you know, they're not human. They're not animals. They can't take care of themselves. And they're just like, they're, they're, they're just sad creatures that live with us. And and I don't view it as as I, I as I said this morning. I love dogs. Two left. You make a decision, Gary, whether they continue to reproduce so we can have animals. It is not on your life. 
it would no, it wouldn't even be interesting. And and so you know, I, I just think you know, I mean, so I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, I never want to see five this way. It's just like puzzles. And, and at the bottom of this, there's just a really tricky life problem. You want an objective answer. When is it? When is it not enough? And it's true with some of our human loved ones as well. I mean, that's that's it. And you mentioned earlier, you know, Anglo American law has a very, very long tradition of criminalizing suicide or attempted suicide or assisted suicide because such a heavy premium is placed not on animal life but on human life. Part of Gary's program for the abolition of the property status of animals um, in Anglo American law is. That you know, you can. It's, it's interesting. You can you can kill your pet as long as you don't do it in a way that's construed as cruel. There's there's no there's no law broken by. And if somebody kills or harms your companion animal or, or some animal that you own, um, you're entitled to the market value of the animal. So if somebody had killed Pindar, who was also a rescue cat with tremendous health needs, very expensive. It effectively had a negative value. Um, I should have paid them. <laughs> you know, there's something perverse about uh, the way of viewing the worth of non human animals that way. The whole idea of conferring or recognizing inherent moral worth in beings is to say commercial value just doesn't get to the core of what it means to be alive. Right. But there's no objective answer to something. Right. And, and you know, people don't understand. Yeah. The proper problem. I mean, you know, and it, it is amazing to me that you know animal people think that they can make animal exploitation quote humane. The answer is you can't. I mean, first of all, I don't even know what that means. But secondly, you're never going to get the level of animal welfare up very high because it costs a lot of money to purchase that level of protection. Mm -hmm. And you know, they don't. I mean, and, and and people often get upset when I say, well, there are property. You know, well, I I love you should see my dog. Oh, my dog. The answer is. Your property. You want to value them high, you value them high. You want to value them low, you value them low. And so, yeah, I, you know, we love our dogs and we treat them very, very well. But if I wanted to have them be our dogs and just live in the backyard and bark when people got near the house, I could do that too. I could basically give them very, very little. Basically, I don't have to give them any companionship. All I have to do is give them food, water, and minimal shelter. That's all I have to do. And if I decide I want to bring, I mean, they're my property. If I value them at zero, I can do that because that is what it means to be a property owner. I can value them at zero, I can put them in the car, I can take them to a shelter, and I can say, kill them. Or if you, if you don't buy a home, kill them. I can take them to a vet and I can say, kill these dogs. And in many states, I can I can kill them myself if I do it too many. So, you know, they're property. And, you know, like I have a car, I can wax it three times a week, I can fetishize it, I can change the oil every thousand miles, you know, that I can do whatever I want. All I have to do is provide the minimal level of protection to get it to inspection. If I want to, if I want to fetishize my car and, and treat it in a particular way, I can do that. If I want to let it rust and let it go to hell, I can do that too, as long as you get to the inspection. Same thing with animals. People just don't get this. It's, it's their property. They are channeled. They have no value. And what's really interesting is we have part of the moral schizophrenia is, on one hand, this is their status, this is their thing, they are property. On the other hand, none of us really believes that. You know, because that's part of what happened in the 19th century was we stopped thinking that way. But the problem is we've never put it together. And and you know, we've never put it together and we don't put it together because because they are because animals are property. On one hand we say they matter, but as far as their status in the, in the society, they don't matter. So we have this this weird thing going on where we think, well, they matter, or animals matter, but they don't really matter, and, and you know, and so we have a mess. Yeah. But but you know, and that's why I really think, you know, animated point, you can't think about this stuff while they're on your You cannot think through these issues while animals are on your plate. And and this is the problem is that we end up having these bizarre discussions. I spend my life going around having discussions with people who are sitting there and who are not vegans, and they're saying so. What do you think about animals? Well, you know what you think about them. You eat them. You're wearing them. You know, and so we know what you think. And and so so it's this is the problem. And as long as we are, as long as we are continuing to eat them and wear them, and, but primarily, I focus on eating because until you stop eating them, nothing changes. 
once you stop eating them, everything, your whole vision is changing. And, 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 um, and I, I really think that as long as we were continuing to eat them, we'll never think clearly about these issues because we're inflicting suffering and death. We're, we're, not, we're all Michael Vick. We're all, we're all engaged in, you know, and, and, and so we end up with these bizarre things like, you know, when they killed Cecil and Cecil or whatever his name was, the lion. Remember the dentist when the dentist from Minnesota killed Cecil and the lion? And I remember writing this essay, and I got, I got, I mean, I spend my life, I get more crap from animal people than I do from, you know, and, and I wrote this essay saying, if you're upset about Cecil and the lion, and you're not a vegan, you're not thinking clearly about it. Or if you're, if you're concerned about the dolphins of Tai Chi, and you're not a vegan, you need to stop worrying about what's going on in Tai Chi, you need to stop worrying about what's going on in your book. And I hear animal people go nuts, and they say, oh, you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't say that, because well, why not? Because that is exactly what needs to be said, you know? Yeah, and I guess how I handle it, though, because I'm not uh, a vegan, um, is I mean, why I'm not a vegan. Because I, 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 it's probably because of habit. Okay. Um, what I was brought up on, I enjoy. I like like it to um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Um, and I use denial. But you're not hiding. Oh, well, ducks. Yeah, I mean, but I can't eat duck meat because I, I, as a kid, I used to feed ducks, and I can't see it on my plate. But I can, I can eat a cow. I can't eat veal. I can eat a chicken, but I can't eat a squab. So you can eat the mom, you can eat the mom, but you can't eat the baby. But you're a very smart one. Think about what you just said. I know, I know. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, it does make sense to me. And I, I thought about it because Gary's the first one that's gotten me to think about it. It's, it's, it's puzzling, you know. I take walks with my dog and I think about this. There's no difference between the animals you love and the animals you think for. Absolutely. I'll say something that Gary doesn't tend to emphasize, and that is, <clears throat> this is an excuse, it's an explanation. Habit plays a tremendous role in our lives. And we become so accustomed, and I was saying it this morning, to ways of thinking about things and valuing things, and all sorts of things in life. And habits can be very, very hard to break. And that all it ultimately, this is the part that the area always emphasizes, all it takes is an act of will. You just have to go back, think about it, and then make a decision, and it's done. It's kind of what I can't get into. And then the time said the problem is that the problem, the problem is philosophical. Philosophical problems are not really problems of theory, they're problems of will. Yeah. And, and I mean, I really, I mean, the idea, if you're doing something wrong, and somebody confronts you with it, and you've got no excuse, then you've got an obligation to stop. You just do it. And this idea, you know, we live in a time where everybody's got an excuse, you know, everybody, you know, because we all have this, you know, we all have, we all tell ourselves stories about that to excuse ourselves from doing stuff that we know is wrong. We need to stop that. And and because because that's not taking morality seriously. I mean you either take morality seriously. It's like overeating, either overeating and getting fat or eating a whole box of chocolates at once or whatever, versus somebody who's anorexic, you know. These are extremes. I try to think that I'm sort of in the middle. It's okay, but not okay. When it comes to harming them, there's no, there's no middle. <laughs> so right now, I want to get more people in this. Ed, you were going to say something a little while ago. Yeah, um, a lot more has come up. Uh, and the idea of positive duties in the future. Um, not just negative duties. Um, now, we haven't heard much discussion of that today. Um, I have a sense you all see much by way of positive means to be I just I just don't believe in domestication, so I think we should take care of domesticating and clear enough we should bring more into existence as far as the body all over concerned. I think we got a really shitty track record of, of intervening. <laughs> 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 well, I'll tell you my answer I was wondering if you're talking about the kinship and the Yeah I do. I do. I have this sort of my own and all the same as there's a fundamental kinship. Yeah. I'm really persuaded I've I've had real great difficulty trying to fill in a positive picture of what things can look like. And I'm really persuaded by uh, the work of a guy named Bernhard Tauren, who's a German um, philosopher, who wrote a book a couple of years ago. Where I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get a contract to translate it for a press in English. I, mean, I wanted to use it for the animals course last term. I, just couldn't, I haven't been able to make it happen. It's a short book called uh, Manifesto of Being Humans. And he has a very interesting idea in that book. 
right? I'm still determined. I'm trying to get it to have a contract, and hopefully it actually comes out in a translation. It's a great book. It's a little book, and it's great. Um, and he says, we can't really reasonably be expected to know what that positive future is going to look like, given two, well, so there's two things. One, given the sort of whole history of uh, conditioning to think against it, and number two, unless and until we get to the point of just letting animals be, you know, John Agoski, who I think had to do a little while ago, brought up that Heideggerian idea of letting beings be, until we do that, we can't really know what the animals have to kind of determine for themselves what their lives are going to be like. And it's not our job to sort of confer a sense of meaning or content on their lives. And for me, that's why the initial step is just to step back and let them be. You're talking about wild animals, right? You're talking about domesticated animals. Well, not, not domesticated animals, but animals generally. You're talking about wild animals, considering the fact you know, how much you invest in the, their habitat and the environment. You know, when they're ground ever outside, mm -hmm. I feed the birds and squirrels. Mm -hmm. I don't bring them into the house. I don't think they want to be in the house. Right. If I were in Athens and I saw these feral dogs, I might try to domesticate a feral dog because they live short, miserable, painful lives. That those particular dogs, I wouldn't breed them. But it's like rat rescue them. Sure. So it really has more to do with the reproduction too. But I think when you know when you're talking about wildlife, there is some interaction that we're gonna have to have more and more as we take away. Yeah, I think most of that is negative term. Just 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 me personally. I'm, I'm not an environmental scientist, I'm not an agronomist, I'm not an economist. Um, I don't have any kind of geopolitical sense, but it seems pretty simple to me. Um, that, People should reproduce a whole hell of a lot less than they do because in so much of people, yeah, I'm talking about human beings refraining from doing things that harm the environment and encroach on the habitat of non human animals. That's the single biggest problem. And the most immediate way we can deal with that is to stop reproducing, not stop, at least you can take the rate of it down tremendously. Um, because every time we build housing for more people we've created, that takes away habitat from non-human animals. You know, it's why people have to put up boxes for their bloopers, because all the dead trees that they would otherwise nest in are cut down for, for condoms and things like that. That's still not a positive vision of the future of non-human animals. So I, I take the point. Okay, what about um, uh, elderly people? We're, we're trying to keep people... Well, I I mean, it's not content to suffer to biomedical experiments. No, I'm only Extending life. Yeah. yeah. We spend a lot of time extending life, and also on the other end, we're producing life. Well, I mean, what we're doing is extending life. What we're doing is we're, we're we get very high priced medicine. I mean, frankly, I think if we all had sensible vegan diets, we would get much less disease. So we wouldn't have, you know, I mean, some point we're all going to die. Um, I'm all in favor. I mean, look, I'm, I, I think you know, that we have limited resources. We should allocate them. These resource allocation questions are difficult. Um, it seems to me that spending huge amounts of money keeping people alive, um, that they're interested in now, particularly when it's so um, serendipitous, but it depends on who's got insurance and who doesn't and stuff like you know, and, and, yeah. and it's, it's, I think, ridiculous. Um, I think we should have so I mean I, I, I find it appalling that we don't have socialized medicine in this country. I just think it is absolutely appalling. And um, and but but um, but no, you know, I, I there are all sorts of difficult moral questions. And I think as far as what Gary's saying about reproduction, I'm I'm all in favor of my views you want a dog or a cat, go to a shelter and adopt them. You want to have a kid, go with them. Oh, you know, I mean there's all these kids that are not gonna have love if you don't if you don't get them. And you don't adopt them. I think adoption is, is great. I think adoption is great. Yeah, but people people want to have part of their own genes. But that, you know, but that, was, that, that, that is true. Yeah, and, like, and, and that is something, that is an idea I think that we need to sort of think about. And just this yeah. idea that, well, you know, we're going to we're going to live forever if we have, you know, if there's something we live if, our, if we have biological children. And the answer is you die. <laughs> if you are going to die, no matter what, you have 50,000 children and you want to die. And yeah, this idea that we're going to live, we have biological children, 
Sure. Levi, you had your hand up a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, it's kind of uh, naive, but um, I wanted to ask what you guys thought about like the, the animals that are able to live within like all of our urban sprawl. And I was particularly inspired by uh, reading news reports that there are actually leopards that are living and surviving and cohabitating in Mumbai alongside humans. I think that's kind of cool. I trust them. Um, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, because we're not talking. I mean, um, that's not really good. Why do you think that's good? I'm just well, because obviously you can't stop overpopulating and, and just growing. And but there's a place where I guess these cats aren't instead of being feared or like shot, they're just like live and let live. And you know, I, I think I think what animals in that situation can the short end of whatever tip we're talking about. And I don't think it's kind of stupid. I think there are all sorts of pathological situations to talk thing as a result of resource uh, you know uh, inequality, overpopulation, um, you know, poverty in general matter. Um, there's an alligator story along the same lines. There was one, I think Jeffrey Masson wrote about it in his most recent book about apex predators. But there's this one village where the, the, there are alligators in the water, and women come in and fill their bas their, their water jugs and have babies crawling around, and the alligators don't bother them. Nobody shoots the alligators, and it's, it's almost like this understanding that they've somehow developed with the alligators. And all it makes me think of, I got nothing interesting to say about it other than that there was a controversy about, what was it, a red tailed hawk, some kind of bird of prey in Manhattan, named, they called it Pale Male. And it was, it was, it had a nest at the building where Mary Tyler Moore, who was a big animal that had to get rid And all the people who lived in the building were complaining all the time about the fact that. There were all these sort of pigeon carcasses kind of strewn about the ground, uh, directly beneath where the nest was, way right up at some high floor in the building, and they wanted to have the nest removed because of that. Um, but I don't know what to say about you know if, if you if when animals are able to otherwise wild animals are able to find ways to survive in urban settings, it's, it's just something that I observe without comment really. You know? Did you have a thought on it? You think it's well, I mean, it, it seems to me, at least compared to like this area, there were also big cats that were once alive, and like I think they've been extinct for a hundred years. I think that's cool that there's a part of the world where, where there are big cats that are, are living and, and surviving among people. I just think it's like the there is like, it's going to be cute until it's not. Yeah, exactly. Some people get scratched. Did you still want to say something? Uh, yeah. If you have a connection question, I'm lying against more of a general one. Um, Terry, do you want to visit? It it's, it's a new question. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this might be misguided, but uh, when you talked about the will, um, um, the morality having a kind of volitional um, nature yeah. to it. I'm a big believer. Um, and so there are sometimes when, people, when you talk to people about um, you have to be, you have to uh, confide yourself to a moral standards. Uh, there is a sense of constraining your will. There is a kind of um, constraining your will to moral necessity. Um, and what's what the kind of trouble that I have with that is um, people use this with love, like the kind of uh, necessity that love places on your uh, on your life is actually freeing, not constraining. Um, out of the so. I, this is what I wrote down. Uh, it's it's like when people uh, the necessity with which caring binds our will puts necessity puts necessity to our like indecisive nature and actually makes us prosper. Um, and do you think it's same with morality, where morality morality puts necessity to our uh, volition and actually frees us, not constrained in in, in a bad bad way. Because it, it could be looked at in a constrained way. No, I, I think. Are you asking if I think morality is liberating because it constrains us in certain ways, but constrains us in a liberating way? 
Yeah. I, I certainly believe it. I mean, when I was responding to Marion's, I was responding to my perception that what Marion would say. Is it Marion or Marion? Marion. I was responding to what Marion was saying that um, that she recognized a problem here, but there was sort of a failure of will. Not not exclude not 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 entirely, but a failure of will. And I was simply saying that well, but what is more? I mean, what is morality? I mean, you know, if we recognize that something is wrong. I have a problem with saying, well, but, you know, it's a, it's a failure of my will. I mean, I, I, I think we have an obligation, particularly when our conduct is not trivial, when, it, when there's a lot at stake. Um, and so if, if I were to say, you know, um, I really think misogyny is wrong. But it's a failure of will, and I'm going to continue to express um, patriarchal attitudes towards my students because I just don't value women, or I don't value them in that way. Um, so, well, wait a minute now. You said you think misogyny is wrong, and there's a lot of stake here. You know, if you give vent to your misogynistic views, there aren't people going. I was going to say, so I, I heard you, so there's a, it's a quotation um, on a building at Harvard Law School, which I know because they always recite their commencement, that referred it so the, the idea is that, that lawyers will the line is fashion those wise restraints that make I think it says men brave. Right? So this I take it is your idea, right? That there are certain kinds of which is which is a different idea from the, right. the, the equally important one you referenced, that there are certain kinds of constraints that we take upon ourselves, not, and, and that, that in a immediate literal sense restrain our freedom, but give us a kind of greater freedom in the long run. Now, I think the idea in, at the, in the law is uh, more about reciprocity, right? So we each take upon ourselves these restraints, and it collectively makes us free because we're, I'm freer if I know that there is law that's going to prevent. My neighbor from stealing my property and so forth. But I take it that your point is, is sometimes more than that, right? That is, if you can take on a restraint just for yourself that makes you freer, not because of some reciprocity with others, but because it's going to then lead, lead you to lead a certain sort of life, which is in a way liberating. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, I was, I was thinking of like, like the Dante's quote where he says, in his will uh, lies our uh, will. In his will lies our peace in paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that kind of connects to like the will of God or will of something that is like, necessary um, freeing us in a sense. I, I think if you, if you take away McMurray's word discipline, or the word restraint and, and place of the moral imperative. You know, once you really see it as a reality and make that connection, it's not question of discipline. It's not burdensome. It's not burdensome. It's not it's not it's 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 going on motivationally. People either are, it is a failure of the will or it's a failure of understanding and they're mistaken about what they understand. When we were talking about it earlier, and I was asked if I was going to write my dissertation on animal ethics, and I said I feel kind of despondent about the prospects of saying anything interesting because it's not the lack of arguments that, you know, we have lots of good, rational, provocative, and convincing arguments. It's the Marian problem. <laughs> <laughs> not much. Not. So, but I mean, my philosophy before, I'm used to dealing with this kind of stuff all the time. It's really intelligent. People will say, well, actually, I, they don't disagree. They say, no, I, you're totally right. Offers the answers. Well, see, that's, I was going to say, what Shashir's question made me think about was, I think about it in an Aristotelian virtue ethics. That <clears throat> depends who you're asking whether it's prudence or not. Because, you know, Aristotle's picture, and, and so it can be either ignorance or opposite. It can be ignorance or weakness of the will. Ignorance is, I'm doing the wrong thing because I don't know the right thing. Opposite or weakness of the will is, I'm doing the wrong thing. I know the right thing, but I just can't get myself to do it for whatever reason. 
with Aristotle, when you finally start doing the right thing, he says, <clears throat> if you don't have a character state that has long practice in it and has a stabilized kind of ethos or character, you're struggling against tendencies that are against the good. And it hurts and it does, it's unpleasant. And it's burdensome and like a discipline. And by the time you've practiced it for a very long time, it becomes very natural and it flows, and you and you can take real pride is honoring the, the virtues and the vision of living that you embrace as being the highest form of the good for a human being. So the person who's not really lived their life that way, hasn't really sort of practiced that, it's going to be burdensome and painful, and it's going to be like where you're going to take it out the crash. But the person who's done it long enough that it's become customary and it's just part of their way of life, it, it, I think it really this is my ideal. It really does feel good. I don't know if it's simple thing that way. I think it's the glass walls thing too. I think if you go to a slaughterhouse and you don't go to a slaughterhouse, go to a farm sanctuary, it's the opposite. Realize the reality of it and connect with it, and then it's like there's no way you could. Well, I'm talking about the part where most of the people that go to farm sanctuary and see that stuff don't. I mean, farm sanctuary is a petty. Basically, and slaughterhouses. Right. People, saying, a lot yeah. of people go to slaughterhouses, right. and then, you know, whatever it takes to realize. What I'm just saying it's not a matter of realization, it's a matter of. Because you're not rational. I hear you. So, what are the implications for advocacy about the virtue ethics? Go ahead. Do you convince people to be moral? You, you, you can't convince everybody. You convince a lot of people. I mean, I, I, I sort of look at it as a numbers thing. You know, it's like I keep doing it because. You know, it has an effect on a certain number of people, and, you know, and I get like, you know, 25 or 30, you know, emails or messages. Can I ask a question about like this? So the idea is, okay, there are enough people that we can get on board and the rest will follow because the norms will change. So what will happen is, 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 is you know, there was an interesting paper done three or four years ago by some people at Rensselaer about that. And what they did was they looked at a bunch of issues, and they determined that if you have 10% of the population, um, committed to a particular moral idea, it causes a lot of change. It causes change rapidly. Now, I don't believe for a second. I mean, I think that if we had 10% of the population had this feeling, there'd still be a hell of a pushback. In that. But what we would do is, right now, the social discourse is about treatment and not use. We don't really discuss it as a society. We don't really discuss use. We talk about treatment. We talk about improving, the, you know, making animal use more humane or you know, making animal treatments more humane and, you know, improving animal welfare. We don't, we haven't yet gotten to a point where we talk about, the, you know, I mean, my view is I don't really care how humane you treat them. It's wrong to use them and we really, you know, which is why I never show people, I never show my students, for example, gory, you know, like I don't show them bird poison. And I used to, actually, I used to take them years ago. I used to take them to the small slaughterhouse in New Jersey. And, um, and I don't do that anymore because I, I don't want them to focus, first of all, but secondly, I don't want them to focus on the gory stuff because in the initial, their, their reaction is, oh, we got to make that better, you know, we've got to improve that, you know, it's sort of like, let's have, let's have closed circuit television cameras in slaughterhouse the answer of why, I don't know that anyway, I mean, you know, but they have cameras and look at it. And, and, um, and so I, I, I think if, if we had 10% of the population that really sort of saw this in a very simple way, we shouldn't do it, um, it would change discourse and we would start talking about use. Um, right now, we're not even at that point. So, you know. So, and my own answer to this is a little different, but compatible. It's, I said before, at the beginning of the day, I'm a cynical person. Um, it's hard for me to envision a world that really changes significantly. Animals, but I'm enough of a Kantian that I, my conviction is I have to do this without regard to what the actual consequences are likely to be. I must do this because it's right. Right. You, the, the, the best hope I have on a pragmatic level is maybe we can kind of ameliorate the ignorance problem and get people to realize it's an acrosia problem. In other words, that it's not just lack of knowing. You know, Eventually, a point comes where we can say nobody can claim that they eat meat because they know that it's not, they don't know that it's wrong. It's because they're struggling with their inner demons or something like that. But for me, 
I don't know how you get that soul conversion in people. It's magical and it's mysterious, and I don't think you can do it. But you will say all day, you and I, it's not a matter of rational arguments because I've had so many people say to me, and I'm sure you've heard this too, you know, I've read your work, I think your arguments for veganism as an ethical obligation are really compelling and I just can't stop you from me. That, that, that's a very simple proof that it's not purely a matter of reason. It's where you use an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, I, I must say it's incredibly hard to be in a room where, you know, where, when you identify it as a vegan, uh, also, uh, uh, don't feel like you're minority, uh, first of all. Uh, it's incredibly uh, empowering. Uh, second of all, I, the question, I think you're, you're uh, absolutely right to uh, focus on what we eat, right? Because I think uh, media and uh, advertisement can you know, sell us man-made uh, plastic, um, uh, plastic clothes or man-made uh, uh, products, you know, shoes, that's, that's in a way that's easy to do. Now, in terms of what we eat, you know, eating is such a, it's such a cultural and intimate act that it's, it's incredibly difficult to change those habits, right? Um, uh, and I'm not sure uh, individual will is uh, uh, is enough in that case, especially if you want to reach the 10% the that you're talking about. Because we're not, we're, you know, we're not individual living, you know, uh, um, in, in caves by, by ourselves, right? We're also part of a culture. The question is how do we um, how do we make uh, veganism uh, uh, sustainable and coherent within the culture that we live in? Right? That, 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 that's that's the question. Right. That's the question. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. 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 And I think a lot. This is. I mean, I think about this all the time. How do you get the message out in, in ways which are comprehensible? And one of the things that you know, I, I generally, sometimes I, but I generally don't talk to people about animal rights. What I do is, and I talk to people every single day. In my view is, I've never let a go back if she goes back to something. So you know, if if I'm you know um, if I'm sitting in the vet's office and somebody else is sitting. With his or her uh, mounting companion, and we're waiting to go in. We said talk, right? Because when people have animals, they talk to each other. So, you know, or you're walking, you know, somebody else is walking, gives it a dog, and you can talk. And you get them talking about how much they love their animal. And then it's just a short, and it depends how much time you get, so it's a strategy. But <laughs> you, 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 you can always get people to start books on. Well, isn't it interesting? We love some animals, we stick forks into other animals. Well, why is that? And I say, and I, say I believe, you look at the way people respond to, to, animal, you know, to, to, to animal issues, the Bible Dick situation. I mean, that was, there isn't, a, there isn't a kid in this country, probably many adults, who don't know about Michael Dick and don't think he was a shit for engaging in fighting those animals. And I'm not sure the millennials know what you're talking about. You know what Michael is that right? Uh, you all know what Michael is that right? I had to tell my students about it. Okay, alright, okay. Well, it's been a few years. That was 2007 when they did it, so it was 11 years ago. But I, you're on like this. No, no. Yeah, exactly. But, so I think that, you know, people, people do, do I really do yeah. think that our conventional wisdom is people think it's wrong to put that necessary stuff. Well, yeah. Yeah. The emotional connection is important, I agree, but it's still, you know, one on one. How do we do this at the cultural level? So, well, we, we have, you know, uh, Sukho's art, for example, right? right? Uh, symbolic representation works really well at the cultural level. I think that's a really good strategy. We have, uh, we have, in terms of disciplines, we have uh, law and uh, philosophy represented, we have art, and I think um, it would be also worth thinking about enlisting. Uh, 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 a great variety of disciplines also. Well, uh, one, one of the things that's happened that's changed a lot is we have so we have you know the opportunity cost of communication has changed dramatically, lowered. So we can we have social media and we can communicate with each other, you know, at a very low cost. And you know, I think that's a way to do So you know, Philippe, as some of you I just want to mention, some of you don't know Philippe, Philippe was a French professor extraordinaire, and I've taken three times with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, a seminar I felt now on gastronomy. And the first time that I took it, I, I just I take French courses in Bucknell because I 
except for the 2020 some French. And whatever seminar is offered, this is my schedule I will take, regardless of the subject matter. And sometimes it's more interesting other times. And the first time I saw that he was teaching on gastronomy, I thought this is the one I can take. It's not very interesting, but when I got into it, I I had no idea it was going to give some very, very significant shape to my thinking about the oil status of animals. And it ended up being influential in a core way of including chapter of my most recent book, that animals and meat of postmodernism. Reading thinkers like Charles Fourier and um, reading Billy Moore and reading Juliette Sagarana and reading all of these uh, thinkers, French thinkers talking about two things, the intersection between the notion of conviviality, which is living together in a harmonious, life-affirming way, and how that happens at the table which is a theme that Philippe has been exploring for a number of years now in his work, it sounds like a sort of adjunct or a supplement to what we're talking about. But I think, I'm just trying to speak with Philippe for a little bit, I think what, what you're getting at is the idea that that can actually have a very vital significance in awakening a sense of how we share certain cultural practices with each other and we share certain values with each other. And the place where this really kind of hit home for me was in my, my, my own realization, even before I took that first version of the course, that I think it's, it's probably impossible, or at least very difficult, to find a cultural practice that all people participate in, that they take more seriously as definitive of their own identity, either individually or culturally, than their eating practices. We all have to eat, right? So the question is, what are we going to eat, right? And what are we going to put on the table that is going to bring us together, right? That is going to make sense, right? That is going to create meaning, right? Yeah, uh, I think that's almost impossible because human beings are quote quote uh, complicated, and we're all more individualistic. And what's right for you might not be right. For oh yeah, but we but we still like to sit around the same table and right. share, you know, share a meal, right? Uh, and that's why the notion of banquet is so, is so important. So, how does it create cultural meaning? <laughs> that's true. I mean, it's better to do that than eat in a car. Should we stop at the uh, Yeah, I want to say, um, kind of going off what you guys are talking about, um, and even you say that like, social media has an influence now, I think it's like um, very impactful for how I am. But I do, I did kind of want to push back on something you said in the beginning. Um, not necessarily like push back, I guess. I kind of want to pick your brain because I wasn't expecting um, to hear that because the first time I heard it. Um, just like your mention of like PETA and mercy for animals and like their stance. To me, I can't help, and like you mentioned that it's just like we're not, there's people aren't just sitting around in circles talking about um, eating animals in a, in a like, philosophical way. Unfortunately, um, if only they were all work. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, how are those like, you know, like Mercy for Animals, PETA, all those kind of organizations that are continuously sharing information about veganism, they're showing videos of slaughterhouses, they're making it known, like they're responsible for making it known to the public, like how animals are being treated. And I would say, if it wasn't for these organizations, that a lot of people wouldn't be vegan at all. Uh, I think. Um, I, there's a topic I've written a ton about, and I'm not going to be able to consume it. The bottom line is that really people are actually commented about that they do much more harm than good um, because they promote the idea that it's all a matter of use of government. So they don't promote, not one of them. And I spent, I mean, I spent my formative years in the early 80s working with people with were about 15 of us, basically. And, um, and, and um, I can tell you, I mean, Peter does not maintain that veganism is a moral imperative. They basically say, well, you know, it's 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 a matter of reducing suffering, and some people choose to reduce suffering one way, some people choose to reduce suffering another way, and these organizations all work with industry. I mean, Peter gave Temple Grandin, who designed Sparta, an award. Now, I think that's true. Peter promotes, I, I, I believe, uh, and we talked about this last night at dinner, that when they started in the late 80s with the idea to go naked and they're free. That was a huge problem for me because I said, you know, we're not going to, as long as we're treating women like we, we're going to continue to treat animals like we, and we just 
this is crazy, this is crazy. And and I think that you know PETA has done an enormous amount of harm. Um, you know, none of these organizations focus on vegans. And I saw an interesting article written by one of the so so called think tanks, which is actually another welfare group supported by welfare groups, saying, Well, the, the reason why they don't promote veganism is moral imperative is because they really can't because they all have to bring in a lot of money. So therefore they you know they have to they have to be mindful of donations so they can't take a radical position. And the answer is I'm sorry, if you're an animal rights organization and you're not taking a veganism as a moral imperative position, you are an animal <laughs> rights organization. And if what and if you need to compromise the message in order to bring money in so you can pay salaries and have offices and send people around the world to take off their clothes rather than wear fur, then you're wasting that that is counterproductive. I think these organizations have done an absolutely horrifying job of of sending out a very, very clear message that it's possible to get exploit compassionately. I think that's dangerous. I think that that is really a serious problem. I really do. And, and I think that, you know, that's why you have the, um, I want to share you what, no, no, right, right, right. No, no, I, I, you're in the middle of it. No, 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 okay. Well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, like, why don't I support single issue campaigns? Well, think about it. You have a campaign with a, a single issue campaign, anti fur campaign. Okay. Now, I have been involved in this for almost 40 years. The fur issue was a big issue when I first got involved. You know what? Fur is stronger now than it's ever been. Okay? People are still wearing fur. More people are wearing fur. If those sorts of things, what you do is you get a group of people together and they say, fur is bad. Um, and fur is worse than leather and wool. The answer is, no, it's not. You know how I mean? You know, it's all horrible. But, but what we do is, first of all, the, the anti fur campaign has been relentlessly sexist, uh, number one. Number two, it, it sends out the message that fur is somehow morally more problematic than wool or leather. Quadra is worse than steak or ice cream. Um, veal is worse than 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 beef or chicken. Um, you know, this is great, but the way the reason why they do these things is because these campaigns require coalitions, and you need to get people to give you money. So what you do is you get a group of people together who say, "Wow, that's terrible." I mean, I eat meat, sure, and I eat fish, sure, and I eat eggs, sure, and I eat eggs. But those goddamn people eat the flour. They're they're barbaric. You know, it's, or, or, or it's the Asian people. Oh, God, those Asian people, they eat dog. You know? And you get people to give money because because they're, they targeted something that they're saying is worse than what they're doing. And the answer is, it's not the It's all the same. And so these organizations, it took me a long time, because I was involved with these groups until, and I wrote a book in 1996 called Rating Up and, um, and basically, it took me a long time to understand a simple point. These things are businesses. It ain't a social justice movement. It is a conglomeration of charities that are all competing for the same dollars. And and they basically they have one product that they sell. They sell out animal interests. I think these organizations are dreadful. Every single one of them. Not one. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to get what? Terry, what were you going to say? Well, that we're covering the territory right um, now. I guess my question was. Um, and I understand the abolitionist and the welfare, and I understand this an anti-democracy. Right. And what you just said. But, you know, kind of backing off a little bit and, and recognizing that the pace of people converting to veganism, you know, is what it is. But, um, you know, there is kind of a loose philosophy of producing suffering. I think at the end of the day, Putting the moral imperative just on the side of that limit, the end result is producing something. So, my question was you know, should a vegan, and let's put aside the post that we're actually supposing there was a grassroots movement for people to refrain from eating any animal products, and yet seven people agree to that, sort of equivalent to. Not on a moral basis, but for what, in terms of something, it's something. Should, should vegans support the meaningful grassroots efforts to reduce animals? So let me ask you a question. If I said to you, you know, rather than getting people to reject racism, 
What we ought to do is we ought to encourage people to be less racist one day a week. You can sign up to do that. That's like somebody that's like having one person who believes in the law. You can keep going there. The analogy I used in the talk, it didn't go really well, but it, it, I think it had the effect I intended to have. This one person said, this is an analogy used, maybe, I don't I think I was comfortable with that. Okay, it worked. They're not comfortable with work. And it was this. Um, the analogy was, if we think that sex slavery is bad, is sex slavery where we provide a good medical care and comfortable beds better than sex slavery where we don't provide it? It's, it's the same kind of an analogy. I mean, so, so I mean, this, in other words, in a narrow utilitarian sense, you could say there's a smaller quantity of suffering. But the question is, does that let people sort of best satisfied that they've done enough, or that somehow it's okay if there's. And I ignore it or promote it, exploitation that's simply been. Well, let, me, let me try another category. How do, we, how do you go about converting people to that standard, making people accept being this? For example, a lot of people don't know anything other than they see the meat in nice shiny cellophane, you know, containers in a nice little supermarket. They have a clue as to how it got there. Um, where they, I, I don't think anybody over the age of 40 makes a false retreat. I mean, basically, people know it about five. I mean, that's why they, that's why. How many times, oh, I, I can tell you, it's very common when you're amongst a group of nine people who say, I don't want, I don't want to talk about this. It will put me off my knee. Um, people know that there's violence. Well, I agree with you. And we had I, one of the sites I had in TaiwanLeague.com. And we try to educate people about how to cook vegan, how to do it inexpensively, and blah, 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 because people get anxious because the scary says, you know, what we eat very important. We keep obsessed about it. And, you know, and we need to sort of educate people about stuff. But uh, what I find, Terry, you Terry, right? What I find is, um, well, I know it's true with people, basically. We can't justify it. If somebody says to me, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, my view is, is that if they hear the message and they think it's right and they're not willing to go vegan immediately, they'll choose to do something else. I will never put a stamp of approval on doing something else because I'm not going to promote um, animal exploitation. I just won't do that. So, you know, now I have done things like if somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I'm really anxious, I can't, you know, I can't. I always say, come look, you know, if I, I have the time, it depends if I'm the lecture. You know, the people come on there, I don't have time. But I'll try to explain to them, um, you know, no, nothing to get anxious about, you can do it. You know, everything you need to know, you can learn in two hours, even if you're a slow reader. But I can give you some things to read, and, you know, I need some sites that you can look at. You don't need to worry about nutritional things if you're if you actually have be much more concerned about what you're doing to your body, about eating all the stuff that you're eating, but it's nothing to be anxious about. And you try to sort of be sure. If somebody says to me, I absolutely can't do it, um, you know, what I have suggested to people, but I'm very careful about when I say this, I can ask them, look, why don't you try vegan for breakfast for two weeks, and then try vegan for lunch for two weeks, and then try vegan for, you know, you'll, you'll see that your arms and legs will fall off, you know, go blind, everything's fine, and then, you know, you try vegan, you know, for, for dinner for two weeks, and then you're vegan. But I always tell them, if you're going to do that, please understand something. You just told me that you think eating animals is wrong. So if you want to continue to do stuff, you would know it's wrong. That's, you know, it, it's, you know, I increase your soul, buddy. Um, but if you want to do it, that's what you do. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it, we have to, I would never tell anybody, oh, well, eat cage free eggs or eat crate free pork or, you know, or, or do, you know, vegan or meat free Monday or that sort of thing. I just think that, that we would, as species, we would never ever do that, you know, in a in a human context. To take this example, or you know, one, you know, I'm, I'm similar sorts of examples. You know, if we, you know, if, you know, rape is bad. Is it better to do it less violently than more violently? Well, yeah, that's a one sense. You know, it's better if you're going to rape somebody that you unfortunately that person in addition to rape that person. But that doesn't mean it's a normal matter. Rape is a good thing, or that we should say, well, you know, gee, let's have, you know. Violent rape free Monday. I mean, nobody would do that. Everybody would, would find that objectionable. And and um, so I think it's really important. And I also think it's important going back to something I said before, and that is, um, I think we can't underestimate in these sorts of situations the importance of sort of talking to people about their obligation. Because you know, if if I said to you, well, when you're talking to somebody about racism. I, I just have a really bad attitude about people of color. 
And and you know, and I just, I know it's wrong, but you know, I just failure of will. You would say, wait a minute, that's not something that you have a right to have a failure of will about. That's how I feel. You know, it's like I don't believe we have a right to have a failure of will. Anyway, Sherry, please. Um, so, <clears throat> so I have a few thoughts. So, so one thought is that I mean, I, I agree with Gary about the welfare approach. I think it tends to be destructive, and I, Peter really has some of the most amazingly misogynistic ads. Like they have an ad that I saw recently that turns out it's, it's not a new ad where they have a woman who's obviously been raped but happy about it and they say her boyfriend just went vegan and that's like that's what I mean, oh, he's, he's, he, yeah, he's, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like like you're supposed to think that it made him more virile and, and I mean it's really like horrifying. Um but you know other organizations I, I think it's so I think it's unproductive. But I think there might the fact is that you might go about things differently with veganism than you do with addressing racism and misogyny in part because you're dealing with something that's even more entrenched and that doesn't mean that you would do welfareism, but that I can see approaching it somewhat differently because you're dealing I mean you're dealing with something that almost nobody takes seriously, that's the butt of jokes, that it's that that um, and so you don't have the luxury, in a sense, of just saying, you know, what you're telling me is just not okay, because they'll just go talk to somebody who doesn't say that, and they'll, they can find them really easily. Um, sure. And so as a matter of strategy, I think you need to, you know, think about that, that, that you, that like if I tell somebody, you know, racism is not okay, and what you're doing is outrageous, and then they go to somebody else, they may hear the same thing. And so that I, you know, I but I need to tailor my message a little bit more carefully if I'm going to be probably the only person that talks to them about this at all. And if I turn them off, then that's well. It, it, it turns them off. I mean, it, 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 um, if you if you provide a clear explanation and you're you know it, it, and you it, you explain, can they find people who will gain say what you say? And the answer is, of course they will. No, I this agree. doesn't mean that we don't have an obligation to occur, right? No, no, absolutely, and I agree with you. But I just think that as, if, if you're like trying to come up with what can I do, and it might be different from what you would do to spread a message of human equality, it's because the message of human equality is not quite as resisted as the message of animal. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that we're all treated equally, but I. But if, like, if I talk about misogyny in, in, in a column, I'll get some pushback. But if I talk about animal rights, you know, I'll get the most bizarre and insane kinds of reactions because, and you know this too, it's because you're talking about something that most people just regard as ridiculous. So, um, so anyway, I don't want to make too much of it, but as far as strategy, you almost have to be creative in a way that you don't for other things because there's less of a well-worn. I'm all in favor of creative strategy. I'm just not in favor of how complicated it is. I agree that in terms of strategy and approaches, you know, in this thing, other disciplines like uh, gender studies, for example, clearly uh, uh, notions of masculinity and gender politics do, you know, are also involved in, sure. in our way to think about vegan uh, and our relationship to uh, uh, media. So, uh, again, uh, uh, in this thing, you know, uh, uh, kind of an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, uh, and uh, also symbolic presentations and also uh, uh, part of the process, right? um, uh, and and, uh, and hopefully uh, a way to uh, to change symbolic presentation. I, I think that, that it's a it's a cultural thing. For instance, um, when babies are born in Africa, they go right to the breast. They have nothing else. And as they as the baby gets back, uh, older, the baby's on the mother's back and she has time. In a very um, really good way, um, and that can go on for a year and a half. Here in the United States, um, number one, we don't have a good uh, maternal uh, leave, um, so that in four to six weeks you have to go back to work. You can't take your baby. You can't take your dog. You can't do anything. So you have to buy a formula or have a boss that'll say, "Yes, you can use the bathroom." Every four hours or whatever to pump your breasts, and then right home and give the baby to, to somebody that's there. I think it's a cultural thing that has to be taught from day one. It can't be like 
But we, but Harry, we're not starting. I, I completely want to take. We live in a culture where some people, oh, yeah. some people don't care about animals, and that's fine. We sort of move on. But a lot of people do care about animals, and yeah. so just get them to see that their care, which causes them to react in the Michael Vick situation or the Andy Robinson situation or whatever, you know, the, in the various situations, it, it, it is such that they just need to sort of more consistent. I, I, I tell you, I, I wouldn't do this if I didn't feel that the time that I spent was very good. The amount of communications I get every week, I mean, I get 300, 400 emails a day, but I'm getting at least, I don't know, 50 emails a week from people saying, you know, I've been a vegetarian for 20 years, I never I saw a you gave, I thought about it that way, why the hell am I going to be? I'm going to be. People are constantly, I mean, it's working. We've got people all over. I don't run an organization. I don't accept donations or anything like that. Um, and we just got people all over the, the planet um, who are doing abolitionist vegan outreach. You know, they they table, they, they go to school, they do, I mean, they're doing stuff. I, I, again, I wrote this book, Eat, Life, and Care. Um, it is now in 14 different languages. Um, you know, the, the book sells like crazy. It's about vegans. It's about all of the excuses that people use to, to not eat. Yeah, I understand all that, but I also know that it takes a long time. Look how long it took for same sex marriage or abortion. Okay, that actually happened. That actually, issues about gay and gay rights right. um, changed remarkably quickly. Quick right. Right. Um, but, um, but isn't the takeaway from that that we better get started right away? Yeah. 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 So let's not, let's not screw it around with welfare. Happy eggs and, and, and you know, and great free pork and that sort of stuff, and be good about stuff. And, you know, and, I, mean, I, think if you, I think if you think it's insulting to human beings' intelligence to act like single vision campaigns or welfareism actually move the needle in any significant way. You know, I mean, that was my own thing. They don't, they don't. There's, you know, why not just call it what it is? It, it's just because we're all so complicated. And right. I don't think it's a question. Today, we had a room experience. To some extent, like I, I like the um, the tofu, and I've had tofu before, but I hated it. But this tofu was good. I think it's some home. But you know, it, to the extent that you think it's hard to be, think about how hard, how hard it is to be, it's not. Right. I, mean, I know. It's it's tricky. I mean, it's something to think about. Is there when you think about the injustice involved? Is there anything really that you want to put in your mouth that can't do? You know. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, but I know it will be a hard decision. <clears throat> well, I'm not vegan yet, but I just was curious as to what we, what everyone here thought about, you know, eating things like bananas. You know, bananas are growing and growing extinct, and the cocoa bean is also one of those things that's. Um, going extinct and I feel like animals is kind of hard to go extinct because we're constantly producing them and I mean there's studies and people doing research on the stem cells meat so I mean like meat's not something that should I mean I'm sure the same thing could be done for bananas and cocoa beans but I mean I'm just saying why are you advocating so hard for animals but not so much for you know consumers behavior and food in general just you know constantly wanting right everything all the time and you know you go to the store and all the avocados are ripe and there's avocados year round in the US where that's not where avocados I will yeah so so I'm not sure what question you're asking right it, is the question are vegans concerned about injustice <laughs> to people for example there's there's slave labor in the chocolate industry the questions are, are we concerned about that? I guess it, I, I mean I certainly sure. am, so I would try to you know I would avoid that, right? Um, there are a lot of known animal products that nonetheless are very harmful to the environment. So palm oil is something I try to avoid, right? So if that's the question, then yeah, absolutely. And some of those can be avoided on not it's not that 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 eating them makes you not a vegan, but some of the same principles that lead us to be vegan would lead us to want to avoid us. If you're asking, am I concerned about bananas for the sake of the banana trees in the way that I'm concerned about the cows for the sake of the cows, the 
The answer is no. And the reason is because the banana trees, as far as we can tell, do not have a subjective sense of self. They don't experience pain and pleasure. They don't suffer. They're not they're not beings, they're things. So I'm not sure. Is that is that responsive? I mean, I disagree. I I do find the I don't know, life in trees and the grows. Oh, yeah, they're 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 alive. Yeah. But but they but they don't have subject I mean they, they don't have subjective experiences. Just because we don't know what it's like to be in oh, do you want that grant? Yes. Okay. Well, but you wouldn't if you believe that grass would not get from If you walk, if, would you walk on a little bit? If there were a bunch of little birds, would you step on little birds? Oh, yeah. No, no, they weren't dead. Would you step on them? No. Well, why would you step on grass if you think that this is all the same? Um, I don't think it's all the same. I just think that the subjective experience of an animal is definitely different than the subjective experience of the grass. Kind of like do you think grass is some sort of mind? I mean, if, if, I, if, I, if, I brought, if I brought a dog in here and I started whacking the dog with a, with a hatchet, and if I brought a head of lettuce in here and cut the head of lettuce, would you sort of react the same way? Would you think I was doing something similar? Absolutely not. Right. Well, a tree has roots, grass has roots. Sure. Um, it's kind of like, I, I kind of think of consciousness as the integrative, um, integration of information, kind of like Tanomi. I don't know if you've ever heard no. of it tonight. Yeah, so I kind of think, okay, there's things that. Like the further diodes that Tononi talks about, you know, the one diode only knows yes, it's on, or yes, it's or no, it's not on. Whereas the like, humans have way more than that. I mean, but the plants, look, plants react. They don't respond. They react to stimuli. But I mean, the, the flower is going to turn toward the, the sun, even if there's a lawnmower coming to cut it out, or like, a dog will run away from the lawn. I mean, it, 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 I mean it's interesting because um, I did a debate with my my work with Martyr. Um, who wrote this book on plant ethics? And 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 I I, I asked him, I said, are you maintaining plants are sentient? Well, no, I'm not saying you know, he talked about something like not not like non-intentional kind. I said, what's no, not, non-intentional? What is that? Um and and, and you know and, and and there have been a number of people who have written books on plant ethics, and and none of them maintains that that plants are sentient. I mean, when pushed, they don't maintain as plants are sentient. Are they alive? Sure they're alive. Um, you know, uh you know, cancer cells are, you know, I mean, they right? So if the question is, ought we have reverence for all life, including non-sentient life like plants and in life, absolutely, right? Um, but the, but given that each of us wants to preserve ourselves and we have to eat something, right? As between reverence for the plants, right, that don't have subjective experiences, but do have, you know, they are impressive in certain ways, and the suffering that we all acknowledge is going to happen to the animals, it seems like an easy call. That's that's the only time. I mean, people also, I mean, you know, there, there, there are all sorts of arguments <coughs> like, actually, more plants are killed in the production of animal foods, and even the plant is because of the calorie ratio, I know. But, but the, 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 you know, the the plant question usually comes, I'm not saying this is in your case, but it usually comes from people who want to say, um, well, everything is everything has value and therefore nothing has value. Right? And so we have to make comparative judgments. So, so I'm not uh, but I'm not I'm not trying to sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to really to understand what the the nature so, is. So right. here's what I was gonna say. It's very the part of it is very close to what uh, Mike was just saying. So some of you have in in 2009, late November, Sunday before Thanksgiving that year, um, I published an op-ed piece in the New York Times called Animal, Vegetable, and Miserable. And it was about the question whether people getting free-range turkeys for Thanksgiving were somehow morally better than people who were getting whatever else they were getting. And my answer was no. And I talked a lot about veganism, ethical veganism. And a couple of weeks later, there's a um, there's a woman named Natalie Angier uh, who publishes science articles for the New York Times, and she published an article entitled it's something like "Sorry, Vegans, but oh, yes, but it's one of the most I that. And it was essentially taking this Michael Martyr kind of approach that says, "Look, you know, plants do all kinds of very, very interesting things." Uh, and there's professors like Chris Martin at this university who's a plant biologist, and he'll tell you a lot about what plants do. It's kind of remarkable. The way that they can communicate drought conditions to each other and so forth. 
Um, uh, but you know, it's we can't exclude logically the possibility that plants are sentient. But to the best of our knowledge, you have to have a central nervous system in order to be sentient, and plants don't have central nervous systems. Then the question becomes what Mike was talking about, which is look, if we have if, if we're going if we're not going to become Jane priests and starve to death, if we're going to kill something in order to live, what what can we do that makes the most sense? And it seems that sentient creatures, this is according to one school of thought, can suffer harm in ways that non-sentient creatures can. That's half of what I wanted to say. The other half of what I wanted to say to you was something more sympathetic, which is I have made a kind of small note of each of the books I've written on animals where I say, <clears throat> unlike Garrett, who thinks that sentience is both necessary and sufficient for moral status, I say it's sufficient, but it's conceivable it could end up not being necessary. That maybe there are other ways, and, and Reagan said this somewhere in his writings as well, maybe there's some other way you can establish moral status without having sentience, but for my own part, I just don't know what that would look like. So, for instance, the idea that there's a moral status to landscapes, mountain ecosystems, the sequoias in California, where I come from, I am open to that. I just don't understand tangibly what that would mean. Um, and that's kind of where I leave that. In other words, I don't want to category, categorically say it doesn't matter what we do to non sentient nature. But I don't think that non-sentient nature should have the same kind of claim on this morally that sentient nature. I never said it. I never said it was okay. Whatever. Why? Why? No, I didn't say it. So you said it's necessary and so. But I'm not. But but the implication is that that doesn't matter what you do with non-sentient nature. I don't say that. I say that we can't have moral obligations that we owe directly to non-sentient entities, so that they can't have moral value in that sense as as being. Recipients of moral obligations. Right, but if it's not direct, then it's indirect, which means we shouldn't harm nature. But well, that, uh, well, yeah, that might be a good argument, but I don't think we, I don't think you owe anything to the body of water. You may owe something to the sentient beings that live in the body of water. To say that we have obligations to molecules of water is something I don't, I don't want. To not, not a good idea. Let me just say one thing about the trainers, about the, the, the Michael was saying about. The I think. Whatever we do, we cause harm uh, to humans mm -hmm. as well. And so, like, I don't, you know, so I about palm oil. People write me all the time about palm oil. No, I don't, I don't use it. But, so you don't need palm oil, you need olive oil. The olive oil is, you know, you don't fetishize the animals that are killed in the production of olives as much as we do orangutan. It's, you know, the orange, the, the varieties. Um, but I don't think, you know, I, I think we ought to consume less. I mean, I actually used to fast two days a week. I got to do that again. But actually, not, because I, I really feel we ought to consume too much of everything. We consume too much garden, we consume too much material stuff, we, we consume too much food. And and I think it's actually a good thing. You know, I think you know, I, I actually was much happier when I was fasting two days a week. And I want to get back to that. Just, you know, and I will get back to that. But, um, but so I think we ought to consume less. But I don't think there's anything. Like, you know, I mean, I, I try to buy fair trade stuff or whatever, but the bottom line is, is that, is that um, you know, as far as the, the harm that comes, you know, like from palm oil, yeah, it endures to around you things. And they, you know, they're, you know, they're very much like us, they're not even great age, blah, blah, blah. But that's like saying, well, you know, I worry about the harm that, you know, that, that, that endures to light skinned black people more than black, dark skinned black people, because light skinned black people are more like me. I mean, I just sort of. That same thing. Can I can I respond to those just one quick thing and then I know the other folks next? Um so so you had asked about bananas and avocados and the sort of the extinction of some of these um, plants. And so what I was thinking was that um, you're right that the animals people eat are not in danger of going extinct at the moment. So that's not but the but to the extent that Extinction is a concern. There's a real problem of extinction of the other animals because, in order to raise all of these animals for people to eat and use, a lot of land is taken both for them to occupy physically 
and to grow the things that they're going to eat. And as a result, a lot of the plants and animals that would have grown and lived in those areas, they can't, including, you know, including the sorts of plants. And so, so this desertification and, um, and, the, and extinctions are very much related to animal agriculture. So to, to such an extent, I mean, you sort of both of your objectives get supported by veganism because you both, what, what you're not eating is leaving open all this room for these things to grow, and you're also not harming the animals. And, you know, obviously you can also eat less of the various things that, you know, and eat locally and things like that, but but you're, you know, you're, they're, they're, they're sort of two objectives that go together. Well, there's monocropping of the Oh, monocropping of the And there's a blight on them. There's definitely a couple of colors. Because a lot of cocoa bananas from Ecuador down from Ecuador. So I hear a lot of workers just complain about how the demand is just too high. Supplies come up. The problem with bananas is this one species of bananas, is cabbage. Yes. And every, there's no seeds in there, every banana you buy is clover. And in the 50s, there's a different species and it got wiped out throughout the world. And that's what's happening, what could happen soon with bananas. Yeah, the blight will wipe out the world's supply of bananas. But then we have to go to another species. So what are we doing? This is serious. I don't know if six of them. I wanted to add some new ones. The distant Inuit idea. I feel like I should, as a person closest to an Inuit, I'm happy. That's a joke. Okay, it's not a joke, I actually am happy. I'm having that five o'clock haze. <laughs> um, you know what? Take a minute, I'll just tell you this book while I'm just collecting the thoughts. Um, so there's dinner at 5.30, and it's like a tofu and edamame stir fry and some other and potatoes and some like real food, but not just good in. And we're having a bananas. And we're involved in a line going to start. And so we'll wrap up here in just a short while, so we'll have maybe 15 minutes in between the collectors. Level. But I hope you will all come as long as you stay this line. And if you don't know what walls is, um, I'm just going to be putting some stuff in the fridge upstairs and then walking over with, with Gary and Mike and Sherry. Uh, we can just walk over together. It's just a stone's throw down here um, at the end of the parking lot. Um, and that's from 5.30, nominally to 7, if I think the last seven. I hope you'll come. What floor is it? So it's when you go into the lane, go inside, you go up a short flight of stairs to the main floor, and then just take a straight left. So that's the, the first floor. floor. First floor. Yeah, not the second floor. Yeah, not okay. the second floor. Yeah. Okay. Did that help or hurt? Thanks. It helped. Um, so, as was mentioned, one reason people grow up and work about Inuits is to be real in conversation. I just wanted to say a couple of things. One legitimate reason or legitimate gotcha point that one might have is that I think is fair is that um, people are testing to see is your moral theory, um, um, does it, can it distinguish between someone who has agency and someone who doesn't have agency? Right, it's just kind of like that's a if some if the theory can't do that, I think that's like a fair gotcha. Yeah. Um so but I think so more the example I get more often is what about the single mother in the desert? Um uh, and as many of you have already argued, those the cases are overblown. But I think that we ought to admit so be, a lot of vegan advocates say, oh, well, actually, vegans are, are the only consideration that are relevant here. We can get protein from other places, but there's a lot of other um, costs that very poor people have, right? Like, they're, if you're despondent, or when you're in a survival mode, you're just not in the right part of your brain to be making um, decisions that you would endorse in some other condition, right? Um, would you say the same thing about well, well, let me just jump in. Yeah. This is where I think Philippe's point is so vitally important. We we, we all uh, gave talks at Rutgers Law School was five years ago at a conference that, that Gary had organized. And somebody said something about what about food deserts? And Gary said, very prudently, we're in a food desert. Rutgers in Newark is it's a food desert, and you can be a vegan in a food desert. The problem is not what veganism requires, 
It's the fact that poor people get screwed six ways. So that was, and so the point I'm trying to tie back to what Philippe was saying is, it's not a matter of in, merely a matter of individual will. It's a matter of things like social policy and cultural commitment and people being willing to do what Sue's art is partly about, which is caring for people who, who are sort of thrown under the bus of society, where there's so much prosperity and people in deep neglect. And that that's what that is about. Poverty makes everything difficult. Uh, right, so when people invoke the poor person, right? So what I'm saying is you can say if some of those cases are overblown, but you can grant that some people are without adequate agency to make good moral choices, but they're in that position if you care about the poor person, then you can say, you can say, well then you have even more reason to be vegan because the reason poor people are in this right. position. Sure. That's right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, so we kind of dismissed the case earlier, and I wanted to. The only thing I wanted to say about this is, and I've said this before, um, for anybody whose life really depends upon consuming animal products, you know, who are we to say that they should just die? I mean, but the, the point is that that's relatively few people, and when Bianca says that these Inuit kind of example is overblown, I think what it means is what Gary was talking about, which is. You know, these whale hunts and things, and we get that electronic GPS and all kinds of interesting right. things. It's not as pure and pastoral as it's made to look, right? What I was that wasn't to do a conversation. I came out of the German answers. I guess it's the line I thought this morning. Or, I mean, no, I don't think she was saying that. I don't know what to say at this point. No, no. Well, some people do. Okay. I think I think that it's a better way to interpret it, and that's right. the way that I said it. People are like, you're testing me, like, you want to take the time to do yeah, it. Well, my if they're going to have, like, a blunt instrument morality, then I really don't right. want to put this. But I would, I would, I would, say, though, I would, I would say that, that um, when you're talking about agency, um, I wouldn't do this, that conversation, I wouldn't do that question as any different from saying, well, are you going to take a really strong position on not robbing people because there are people in really poor situations and they have nothing and they engage in violent acts to get property from other people. We can <coughs> exactly you don't know. We can we can um I make a musical about them. Exactly. <laughs> what a good idea. Um and and um, we we might say that we understand what's going on there and we think that the the, 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 the circumstances require some mitigation. But I don't think that, I mean, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't say, well, it's okay. You would say, well, it's not okay, but I understand why it I, I understand, I, I would say. Well, that's what I was saying. You make those caveats, and then as a, as, a, as a strategic matter, you say, but let's just grant there are a few people in this category of people with no agency. So then you can get off the ground with them, right? Because I just think they're, mm -hmm. they're getting at something. Oh, I was. <laughs> yeah, so I was just, I was asking the expert. That was it. So listen, why don't we do this? Uh, it's, it's a little after 5.15. Why don't we break briefly, gather our things, slowly start to mosey our way over to Lost Lounge. Can I see what Lost Lounge is? It's a big lounge. And we can still continue the conversation. Because uh, oh, okay. food makes everything better. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody, for doing the live. Thank you, everybody, there, too.